Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Contemporary Korean music is not limited to K-pop. South Korea boasts a vibrant indie music scene, and neighborhoods such as Seoul's Hongdae have live bands performing across various venues every night. Our guest for this episode, Stephen Epstein, is probably one of the most acute observers and academic researchers of the Korean independent music scene. He kindly agreed to talk to us about the genesis of Korean indie rock since the 1980s, its political and societal underpinnings, the relationship between indie and mainstream, and of course, some of the most influential bands in Korean indie music. Stephen Epstein is Associate Professor and Director of the Asian Studies Programme at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. He earned his BA from Harvard and his MA and PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Epstein has published widely on contemporary Korean society, popular media and literature, and has translated numerous works of Korean fiction. He is also the co-producer of the documentary Us and Them, Korean Indie Rock in a K-Pop World a follow-up of his earlier documentary, Our Nation, a Korean punk rock community. Both movies were selected by several film festivals worldwide. Stephen Epstein, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you, Alan. It's very nice to be here. You came to Korea more than 25 years ago. What brought you here in the first place? Well, initially I became interested in Korea. I grew up in the United States. I've been in New Zealand now for over 20 years. But in the U.S. I had a number of friends who were Korean-American and I became interested particularly in Korea that way. And when I was in grad school, there was a course offered on Korean literature in translation, which I found absolutely fascinating. And the following summer, and this was in the school year 1986-87, and I decided to come to Korea in 1987. People who have some familiarity with Korea will know that the summer of 1987 was a very, very interesting time, really the height of the democratization protests and the movement. And seeing that go on really pulled me in to the country as well. And I I just had a great time here. I met a lot of terrific people, many of whom are still friends. And I never really looked back at that point. So why did you decide to research South Korea's independent music scene? So that year that I was here, which was a wonderful experience in so many ways, had one significant drawback for me. It's hard to imagine from the perspective of 2015 just how different Korea felt in the late 1980s. But one of the significant differences was the music that you would hear ambiently in Korea at that time if you were going to a cafe with friends that either you would be hearing Western soft rock, stuff like the the Carpenters or the Eagles, which is not really my type of music, or the Korean popular music of the time, which is very different from where K-pop is today. And in grad school, I was playing in bands. I'm a huge music fan very much to this day. It's a, a major, major part of my life. And I just found the music really, really difficult to deal with. So that was a a problem. But I had become very interested in Korea, was doing research on Korean literature. I had a project to come back on sabbatical in 1998. I was here at the Academy of Korean Studies. And before I came over, a friend of mine, uh, Mike Shin, who in fact is another Koreanist, he's the professor of history at Cambridge now, he said, Steve, when you come, you should be sure to go to this club in Hongdae called Drug. Go check it out. I think you'll really like it. And so early on on that trip, I made the journey all the way up from the Academy of Korean Studies down in Bundang, quite a ways away, up to Hongdae, to the club. And as soon as I walked in, I felt, wow, I have finally found my spiritual home in Korea because the music was really great or it was it was definitely enjoyable. These were bands that I still remember the lineup of the, the first night 
The first band I saw was Gum, who have since metamorphosed into a band called the Yellow Monsters, who were playing around. And they were really energetic. They were very clearly influenced by Green Day. And it was a lot of fun. And then that night, also a band called Shipal Krak played, and uh, this other band called Crying Nut, who I was very, very taken with. And the people were really friendly. Chat was chatting with people from that first night. It wasn't a big crowd, maybe 40 people. But it was good enough that I thought, I want to come and hang out here a lot. And given the distance at that time, I was making the journey two or three times a week. So very significant. I don't do that kind of travel anymore on the subway. I've become a bit more stationary, but it just gives a sense of how much it meant to me. And so I was there purely to be part of the scene, to hang out, to listen to the music. At that point, one of the things that I I tell people is Crying Nut in its early years was just an amazing band. I felt that I was really lucky because I, I genuinely believed that I was seeing what may have been the single best live band in the entire world at that point. But the whole time I was there, the question that was coming to me, being an academic, was not only am I really enjoying this as great music and having a really good time, but this is fascinating. What is it that has allowed an indie or punk scene to arrive in Korea in the late 1990s when it was not even something that you could have imagined a decade ago. So towards the end of that trip, I thought to think, you know, I really should write something about this. And so I began working on it. So it really wasn't as some people say, hmm, I want to write about Korean indie music or whatever, and and then go and come from it that way. To me, it was much more organic, and that is something that I actually appreciate about my relationship to it is I started out because I really liked it and then converted to writing about it because I'm an academic. What did you find? How did the punk and indie scene develop in the 90s? Yeah, that's one of the issues that I really focus on in in the first lengthy piece that I, I wrote on what happened. And there are clearly a variety of factors that were going on. And I think the ones that people might first initially turn to that seem really important are political and economic. And for one thing, politically, the fact that you had democratization really made a big difference culturally in what was happening in in Korea in the 1990s. And when I look back now, I think of the 1990s as being a particularly exciting time, that there was a sense of possibility, a loosening of restrictions, loosening of censorship. You can see what happened in the film industry, for instance, that from the mid-90s on, and for a decade, I think Korean film really entered a golden age. And in places like Hongdae, you started having people who had a resistant approach to mainstream culture who were coming together in trying to create alternative movements to the mainstream, and that expressed itself in music. So without the military dictatorship, there's a loosening of censorship. For music specifically, one of the most important things is you started to have the possibility for live clubs the military regime had really kept a very tight clamp on what was happening with, with playing live music because you think you're, you're getting people together, playing loud live music, that you have the potential for subversion going on. So just having places to play meant a really huge difference for bands to be able to come together and to find performance venues. Economically, Korea had really been coming along. It's grew, those were still through the 80s and, and into the 90s, the big growth years. So there was more money. People just had more disposable income and were able to use it in different ways. Also, political and economic, I I would say, is, again, with the change in the political structure that there was a real loosening of passport requirements. And that made a huge difference. So people began to travel much more frequently, people going abroad, people becoming exposed to outside musical influences, bringing them back, bringing back CDs, sharing them with friends and the like. So people were getting much more knowledge 
of the music that's happening overseas. So from the mid-90s, you, you start to have these clubs. Into the later 90s, one of the other ways that people are becoming much more familiar with indie music around the world is through the internet, is really starting to catch on in Korea at that time. And technologies like the MP3 makes a huge difference if you can get exposed to music that way and download music. So people have much more knowledge of what's happening. Globalization is a buzzword of the Kim Young-sam presidency, so people are much more conscious of these global influences and, and forms. And another reason why punk more specifically took off at that time is you just have this historical accident of the revival of the punk scene in the U.S. in particular at that time with bands like Green Day and The Offspring and Rancid. And I suppose another touchstone for the Korean scene and around Asia was Nirvana in the early 1990s. And Nirvana also had a really big influence on people wanting to do alternative rock. One of the things that I have only realized in retrospect, because I was very focused on Korea in the, the late 1990s and wasn't as aware of what was going on around Asia, is Korea wasn't unique. I thought a lot of this story was unique to Korea, and some of the factors I've given you are, are very specific to Korea, but you can see punk and indie scenes forming in Asia around this time, probably because of some of these same issues about globalization and the punk revival and Nirvana and so on, that people are, are getting exposed to that. It's interesting now to try and look more broadly at Korea within a larger Asian surge in, in punk and indie music. Was the Korean punk and indie scene at the time resisting against something specific, or was it more a general resistance? Good question. Um, a general resistance. Yeah, I guess in a sense I'd call it a general resistance. So that, that in the 90s when you were asking people why they were participating, that what they would talk about, I think there were two words that were most frequently used. You know, chayu. So freedom, it was an expression of freedom, just a sense of being free. On the first punk CD that came out off the drug label, there's a phrase about letting the energy of our youth burn. And people were young. It was a very energetic, a very vibrant scene. The other word was stress, stress. You know, stress del pulda. So people wanted to blow off stress. So... My first piece, actually, what I do is I, I kind of compare Korean punk with what people think of as classic punk from the late 70s in the UK with the Sex Pistols. And maybe the iconic two punk songs would be God Save the Queen and Anarchy in the UK. And Anarchy in the UK starts out, I am an anarchist and I am the Antichrist, don't know what I want, but I know how to get it. I want to destroy passersby. Whereas one of the anthems of the punk scene here was crying that song, Gan Megi Seagull, which is basically told from the point of view of both a boy and a girl in alternating voices. And it's like, you know, dad says you got to do something with your life, but I don't know what it, I can do, you know, in this tiny room of mine. And the next verse from a, from a girl's point of view. Mom says, I've got to marry into a good family. That rich boy I met yesterday doesn't really suit me. I want to be free. I want to, I want to leave this place. I want to get away. So again, it's a really, really different ethos you get from, you know, I want to destroy passersby to the rich boy doesn't, I met doesn't suit me. It wasn't very political. So you can find little bits and pieces within the scene, and I can think of songs that have a, a political edge to them. But more it was problems with parents, issues with the education system. That was what people were resisting against, rather than specifically resisting against the government. There's really has been very little of that. Some of the more interesting songs, uh, one of the bigger punk bands, Rux, had a song about military service. You know, I don't want to go. I got to go. I don't want to go. And resentment about that. There have been some more anti-American songs on one of the early punk compilations. There's a song called Fuck USA, so something like that. But I can't think of that many songs that really, or at least not from the more well-known bands that have a, a, that kind of political edge to it that you find in more political punk overseas. For neophytes such as myself, could you maybe give us the name of a few bands without which Korean indie music would not be the same? I would say within indie music, because it can be fairly large, there have been a few bands that have been particularly influential 
and I have followed the thread, which is more punky than others, but some bands that I, I would certainly point to, Crying Nut, who I mentioned, and who've been really the biggest indie band, I would say, from Korea and well-known within Korea. In 98, 99, on their first CD, they had a song, Maldalija, which became a big hit and is very well-known to people. You'll find it on playlists at Norebang. Uh, in karaoke places, so that it's something that is is known to people. And they've done World Cup songs. There's another band called No Brain, who were another one of these early punk bands that also shows up on TV from time to time. They were in the film Radio Star, and so they have made something of a name for themselves. And there are other bands that will show up on, say, soundtracks from that early indie scene. Third Line Butterfly has been around for quite a while. And they've won awards and have songs on, say, drama soundtracks. So those are, are some that go back. There are some bands I'd want to single out, I suppose. Uh, the Geeks is more of a hardcore band. They're interesting because they are very well known within the hardcore scene overseas. And they're a band that people would point to. And then Delhi Spice, some of the bands, the indie bands from the 90s that aren't around any longer, we could throw in there as well. Thus far, we have discussed Korea's independent music in fairly broad terms. Uh, we have mentioned punk, we've mentioned indie, independent. But what do all those terms mean? And more importantly, is there a difference between indie and punk? Yeah, definitely there's a difference between indie and punk. And punk is a genre that people would say began to rise in the latter half of the 1970s and it has a particular oppositional edge to it. Indie is an interesting term. So you started to have punk, which was a movement in, within rock that was reacting against mainstream, say, hard rock or progressive rock that was popular in the 70s at the time, album-oriented rock. But then punk opened up a lot of possibilities for what was happening in music, and a lot of it has to do largely with the economics of the industry and distribution channels. So you had more and more people creating their own independent labels. So independent, indie really comes from independent, obviously, and has to do with people who weren't affiliated with the major labels and just wanted to make music and were very much DIY, do-it-yourself, in saying, hey, we like music, we want to play in clubs, we're, we're developing our own fan base and we want to release it and do things on our, our own terms rather than signing ourselves away. And so you had these labels that were being set up and you had the punk scene and then there were other terms that were being used, new wave and post-punk into the, the 1980s. And then you started to have the rise of the term alternative was being used more frequently than indie. But what happened with Nirvana and bands like Pearl Jam is then alternative started to become actually fairly mainstream and had a lot of successes. So the term alternative came to mean a particular branch in terms of the sound of rock music as well. Indie, I would say, really started to take off as a particular term in the 1990s, late 80s, into the, the 90s, and a lot of it was kind of lo-fi, very small label sort of stuff. And it, it had a particular sound initially, but as often, and I suppose this would be true of punk as well, that it can represent a musical style, it can represent an ethos. With punk, it can be a philosophy, it can be a fashion. And it's a term that gets used, but then winds up having a variety of meanings. And if you take indie as simply having this larger meaning of being on small labels, well, then it can be applied in a whole bunch of arenas. So it's just the larger umbrella term, although some people have a particular musical genre in their head when they hear the term indie. Um, I guess I, in the interview so far, I haven't even mentioned the documentaries and how they, they came about. But I'll just say here that the second documentary we call Us and Them, Korean Indie Rock in a K-Pop World, and we really struggled with how to name 
the documentary this time. The first documentary is called Our Nation, a Korean Punk Rock Community. So it was set at one particular club that really did have more of a punk dimension to it, or it leaned in that direction, although a lot of people would argue, as often happens with punk scenes, you know, is it really punk? Is it fake punk? Whatever. But with the second documentary, clearly a couple of the bands that we were dealing with were not in any way punk. People wouldn't call them punk at all. And so we didn't want to use punk, and then we were thinking of using underground, but some of these bands have had success, so when you have success, are you still underground? So we settled on indie. But we weren't 100% satisfied with that. And then we added indie rock because these were rock bands. You have plenty of other indie bands here in Korea who have their own sound, which is nothing like the bands that we focus on. And in fact, interestingly, what has happened in the last few years is that indie is becoming a hot term within the Korean music scene. And in fact, Korean indie, I would say, is becoming quite mainstream. It is within Korea a particular style of music. It's not a K-pop style, but it, Korean indie, or even worse, K-indie, branded with the letter K, tends to be very let's call it non-threatening music, softer acoustic instrumentation with cutesy vocals, and a lot of the bands in it have kind of cutesy names. I've found three different bands that use Rabbit in their name that I would put within K-Indie as well. And some of these K-Indie bands have come to the fore through audition shows on TV. And so they are really mainstream bands in my reading for people who don't like k-pop synthesized k-pop but want stuff with acoustic instrumentation and kind of bossa nova or jazzy inflected sounds so that's a, an issue that that comes into play here it gets fairly complex leaving k indie on the side is it possible for an indie band to actually be a commercial success can you be both or does one preclude the other With that, I suppose it really depends on how you want to be defining indie. So if it is just the musical style, then absolutely. You can have what is considered to be an indie style, and then you can catch on and become quite successful. And you see this happening in the West, and you can see it happening here. Really, I remember when Nirvana's when Nevermind came out. And some of the songs on that album are pretty aggressive and very punky. And I just remember being amazed that that had become the number one album in the United States. Here in Korea, there have been some indie bands uh, that have had successes, like uh, Changi Ha in the Faces, which is a band that in fact comes right out here out of this campus. That he is a student here at Seoul National. If you then show up on national television, are you still indie? Yeah, I would say so. It's your musical style in, in that sense. But one of the issues when you are coming from being a DIY band, so if you're trying to do things yourself and you have commercial success, you will often be criticized for selling out. So I would say my personal take on this because it's a question that resurfaces constantly, is the extent to which you're being true to yourself. And if you're being true to your ideals and you're maintaining control, and it just happens that what you're doing catches on, well, more power to you, really. I think if you change your style, your musical style, you change your lyrics, that's a different issue. If you're saying, hey, we'll make more money if we change then you can legitimately criticize people who are doing that because that is selling out. That's very literally choosing to do something for the money. But if you say, hey, we've been doing it this way all along and ah, suddenly we've become successful, well, there's, I don't see a problem with that. I remember Green Day's breakthrough album because they had already released a couple of CDs and they were a band from Berkeley which is where I went to, to grad school and I was a somebody I, who had been to see a few of their shows. I was on their mailing list and when their first major label album came out I got a postcard from them and then they were saying hey check it out and they had kind of an ironic take. You know we're on a, a major label but we're still doing the same music, the same songs. In fact they're the same three chords 
which was true, <laughs> but they had a big breakthrough success with it at that point. Recently, the term indie has been criticized for, well, as we have discussed, its lack of a clear, definite meaning. For example, Morrissey, the former singer of the Smith, has been quoted saying that, and I quote, the word indie is meaningless now. It's so overused that people think it simply means green hair. Do you agree? It, yes and no. I, I think it, it can be used in ways that have pretty much stripped it of its meaning. So I think with a lot of labels that we use, that they're contested and they're always being negotiated so that they make their way into common popular discourse and various people will have their own take on what it means to be indie and they're not going to necessarily agree. And I suppose you can say if there's so much disagreement around a particular term that we can't settle on its meaning, then it becomes meaningless. And it could be that one quarter of the population agrees and has one particular set of meaning for a term and it has meaning for them, but other people use it in different ways. So that's a problem with almost any label. I think this is one of the things when you're coming at things from an a academic perspective and trying to achieve definitions, this is just one of the issues that you encounter whether you're talking about something cultural or whether you're talking about, I don't know, globalization or democracy or any of these larger terms that we need to come up with a clear understanding of. Very frequently, there are different people who understand the term in different ways. So focusing on South Korea, what is South Korean indie? When asked about South Korean music, most people would, well, either think of traditional music or K-pop. What makes Korean indie music uh, unique compared to those two other genres? That's a really good question. I would say, for one thing, that it is really hard to define Korean indie from a musical perspective because there are so many subgenres within it, from punk to electronica to dance, rock. I would include some metal in there. There's the K-indie variety that I was talking about. There is, in fact, a channel on YouTube, Mirabal Music, that proclaims itself the sort of the one-stop shop for things indie from Korea. And they have playlists that are divided up by musical genre, but they're throwing in jazz, blues, reggae. And when you see that, and all of those clips are stamped with K indie. So it really raises the question of how do we understand indie here? And again, I think it's just that they're trying to promote bands who aren't signed to a major label. Early on, instead of this K indie thing, in something of an ironic way, the early punk bands took on the, the mantle Chosun punk. And they're looking at the term from the Chosun dynasty and, and so on, and the term that South North Korea still uses for itself. But they were trying to give a sense of something that's particularly Korean about what they're doing. And I think a lot of the bands do deal with this question, try to understand, are we a band that is simply doing, playing a, a particular genre of music that is global and we happen to be located here in Korea? Or are we putting a Korean stamp on it? And I suppose one obvious way in which a Korean stamp will be put on is if bands are singing in Korean or there can be things in the melody or the rhythm that bring in more of a Korean sense. I think that ska punk, for example, draws on tarot, a particularly Korean genre, which may give it a bit more of a Korean feel as well. One of the most successful indie bands at the moment, a band that has impressed a lot of people, are Jambinai, who use traditional Korean instruments like the hegum and the kayakum within it. And, and they're sort of a post-rock band, mostly instrumental stuff with very dreamy textures, loud, soft, loud. They're really good. I, mean, I think they're a really impressive band. And, and they, too, a lot of people would be very obviously Korean because they have traditional Korean instruments in their makeup. But you'll find other bands here that almost reject, I would say, their Koreanness. 
One of the bands that I think is very talented that I happen to like a lot is called Love X Stereo, and they are achieving a buzz overseas. They've played in a few festivals. They're set to go to South by Southwest, which was one of the biggest music festivals in the world again next year. But they sing entirely in English, and in interviews... They have gone on record as saying things like, we'd rather be known as just a good indie band rather than a good Korean indie band. And to them, I think it's just more important to be known for their music than from where they they come from. And they are particularly influenced by a lot of the electronic dance bands from the 80s and 90s, uh, New Order in particular. And they make music that follows on within that tradition, but they've got their own style and have a really good sense of melody and dynamics and and the like. And I don't think there's any reason they can't compete at a global level just staying within that style. And one of the other things they've, they've said within that is really once a band is successful, it doesn't matter where you're from. What about the industry itself? How does K-pop differ from Korean indie music? Well, one of the major differences between K-pop and the indie bands that you will find at Hongdae is the way they come together, the way that they are managed. K-pop is an enormous Enormous and enormously successful industry now in Korea with huge management companies, you know, SM and YG, JYP being the, the most well-known, that have a really interesting system in that they take young people and they train them for several years and then put them together into idol groups. That's really the main venue for getting K-pop people out into the, the world at this point. So they invest a lot of money and they reap big profits largely from having them appear on television and the like doing advertisements, touring more than from the actual physical sales of music, which have really decreased over the years in Korea. Korea was the first country in the world where digital sales surpassed physical album sales. So there is a difference in the production and the distribution. Indie bands, those are groups that will have just come together. They like playing music or you advertise for a bass player or or whatnot. And they are largely, a lot of the bands aren't really even there specifically to be making a living from their music. They are there because they enjoy playing music and they are having fun doing that and see it as an act of creative expression. So when they're releasing CDs or music on independent labels, these are just small DIY, do-it-yourself little production companies that put something out and they won't sell a huge number of copies. And a lot of bands don't necessarily make a lot when they play out. Now, some of the bands that have gotten bigger, Crying Nut is an interesting example. They have, from time to time, TV appearances, but they'll also play corporate events and the like and to make a reasonable living, enough for them to be playing music full time. That is one one of the ways, just in terms of the economics of the industry. There aren't a lot of bands like that, but that's an interesting development that has occurred. That was one of the things that came out of the interviews when we were doing the follow-up documentary. That was kind of a surprise to learn that that was how they were getting on. We will talk about the means of survival of those bands in just a few moments. But first, how divided are Korean indie music and K-pop? Is there no interaction between the two? Uh, Do they interact at some times? Well, the level of interaction can occur in a couple of ways. In one sense, I would say that the bands that are playing at Hongdae really have no particular connection to the K-pop industry. But there are some who are touring overseas, and there have been umbrella organizations that are trying to get 
Korean bands, regardless of where they stand in terms of their, their genre, out to perform internationally. So, for example, you have the DFSB collective run by a Korean-American guy named Bernie Cho that has been promoting Korean music overseas, both through touring and he's been doing a lot of work with trying to get Korean music onto websites like Spotify and the like. And they've, been, they've done well with that. There have been some recent successes. So when, for example, at South by Southwest, you will have Korean nights specifically. They're, they do a tour that is branded as Soul Sonic, where they bring a bunch of indie bands to play together. But there's also been something called K-pop Night Out. And in fact, with the K-pop Night Out, they've had indie bands play with K-pop bands. So in fact, last year or two years ago, you had Crying Nut performing on the same bill as K-pop stars like Hyuna from 4Minute and the female in, in Gangnam Style and Jay Park, another huge K-pop star. And it's interesting that Crying Nut managed to appear on that bill. But you also have a band called Hollow Jan, who is what I would call a screamo band, who played that night. And it's interesting because that was a very big night. You had somebody of the stature of Lady Gaga showing up in the audience. And I'll bet a lot of people who were there to listen to Jay Park and Hyuna were really taken aback when Hollow Jan was on stage because their music is really pretty aggressive. And is there a deliberate will among indie musicians to go against K-pop trends? I'm not sure I'd talk about it as a deliberate will to go against K-pop trends in that the music they're playing really doesn't sound anything like K-pop at all. And they most bands wouldn't even see themselves necessarily as interacting with K-pop as such. That said, with a lot of these bands, what is interesting about Korean independent music and Korean punk music or Korean trance, electronic or whatever, is that what has happened as a result of the international rise of K-pop is Korean bands, unlike bands in a place like, say, Indonesia, which has a wonderful Indian punk scene, I, I would say, is that people are curious around the world about Korean music. They know K-pop, so they are a little bit more interested in hearing what more interesting music comes out of Korea. Hmm. And the people will go online and look for Korean indie stuff in a way that I don't think necessarily happens with some other nations in Asia. Gangnam style itself certainly had a major effect on the ability of Korean bands to get themselves heard overseas because suddenly you have the most viral video sensation that the world has ever seen coming right here from Seoul itself. And I think that really is something that nobody could have possibly predicted, but it has an um, interesting effect. So that even before Gangnam Style came out, you started to see these Korean night out at South by Southwest and Canadian Music Week, but I don't think there's much question that it, it's brought additional attention to indie bands here. The financial survival of indie bands always seems to be a big problem. How do they survive on a day-to-day -day basis? It really varies from band to band, and some of the bands have been more successful in playing music and making a living from playing music. For example, Crying Nut, who make a living playing music and do a lot of corporate events. But a lot of people just have day jobs. So just thinking of the bands that we deal with in the documentary, For example, I know that Sang Won of Third Line Butterfly, who leads that band, teaches music at uh, one of the universities in, nearby in Seoul. And interestingly, the Geeks, hardcore bands, one of the reasons why they took their names is because these all guys are all pretty smart, intellectual sorts of guys. A few of them are in IT. Gisok, the leader of the Geeks, is he's got a good middle management job with GM Deu, and it's quite remarkable, I think, that one of the things he comments on in the documentary is that his involvement with the hardcore scene has actually been very helpful to him in work. For one thing, it's enabled him to interact with the wider world, and he's got really good English. 
So it's, he's been able to develop fluency. He's developed an ability to bring in bands from overseas to execute, really to put on tours and show that he's a really, really sharp, capable guy. And I think they appreciate that. He says they appreciate that at, at work. But it's interesting to see somebody who's just got a real chabal sort of job playing the, the kind of music that he does. Whatever that means, another one of the bands that we focus on, a band locally, it, well, they're interesting, and this isn't something we've touched on yet, but they're led by an American who is in the group, but he teaches English at a university here as well. So you have people who are holding on day jobs, as I say. For a lot of people who are in the indie scene, it's just something that is a core part of their identity and adds to their lives rather than being their primary source of income in any way. The Rock Tigers, who have since broken up, a lot of the people in the Rock Tigers actually teach music. That was how they get on as well. So they're people for whom music is a central part of their lives, but it's not by playing through the band itself that they're making their living. How much of a commercial force has independent music become in Korea since the 90s? The crowds seem to be drawn first and foremost by pop music, Yet at the same time, there's a number of large-scale festivals every summer to celebrate indie rock and punk in Korea. I wouldn't really say it's a commercial force at all. There are these events, and to be honest, I'm not that sure of the economics of them. I've heard of them. Some, I know, lose money. And again, even the, the most successful bands aren't going to be making huge amounts. Now you have some of these bands that are being branded as indie who I think are coming into contact with bigger companies that are appearing on TV and being marketed who probably are, are making some money for somebody, bands like Busker Busker and CN Blue that are, again, I think people within the indie scene as such might dispute the label of even calling them indie because of, of what happens, which gets back to your early question of can you be indie and also have these commercial successes But it, it really has more to do with the difficulty of definition of what counts as indie in the first place, in their case. A topic we've already discussed a little bit is selling out. Do such concerns exist in South Korea? And if so, where is the line drawn? I don't think there are many indie bands, especially those who are coming out of the Hongdae scene or playing in Mule, who are really worried about selling out. I think that, in fact, it's almost as though the line has become starker with the success of K-pop or an awareness of the rise of K-pop that bands feel quite content to be doing what it is that they're doing. More of a problem is just to keep the scene going. So it's curious in that I, I think that some people see that what is happening domestically is becoming more difficult as Hongdae fragments, as rents rise, as people are being pushed out. It's becoming a bit harder, perhaps, to find places to play. But as that's going on, there are also these opportunities to market yourself internationally through social media, on YouTube, with Bandcam, and the like. And bands, almost by coincidence, in the second documentary, almost all the bands, or well, all the bands that we dealt with, in fact, played overseas within a year of our doing the documentary, in fact, specifically within the United States. So that's pretty remarkable. If you go back to the late 1990s, none of the bands were thinking that they were ever going to be able to perform overseas, or maybe they thought as a dream, but it wasn't yet on the radar as a realistic possibility. And now a lot of the bands are thinking that very quickly, well, there's an opportunity to move overseas. And there can be possibilities for institutional support. One of the interesting things that's happened is that COCA, the Korean Creative Contents Agency, is helping to fund some of these bands. They're offering support when they're playing at festivals overseas. So the Korean Cultural Centers, which are part of the public relations apparatus of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that you get bands who are playing indie rock showcases. For example, the Korean Cultural Center in London had an example of a, a showcase recently going on as well. So there are a variety of different trajectories that can be observed happening at the moment. <laughs> 
Does that mean that essentially there are no independent Korean bands in the sense of independent from financial and political interests? Oh, I think that most of the bands are independent, I would say. It's just a, a small number who happen to have the opportunity to get these sort of funding possibilities that, that take them overseas. I think there would be a question of the extent to which any of the bands that do so are being co-opted. And to be honest, I, I really don't think they are. I don't think I've never heard for example, of a case of one of these bands being told, well, we'll send you to London, but you can't do this song or do it this way or you have to carry a teguki on stage or something like that. I really don't think that that's the case. They're not being told, for example, now you have to sing in Korean, you can't sing in English anymore. In fact, it could even work in the opposite direction. We want you to be international, sing in English, don't sing in Korean. But there is no case that I've heard of where there's been an attempt to exert creative control. It just is odd when you compare what happens in Korea with the way indie bands from, say, the U.S. would travel. But it's a, part of it just has to do with a, a vastly different approach to the market. And it says something, I suppose, just about the way that Korea's cultural industries have developed over the last decade that the government sees what happens in the various spheres of cultural activity, whether it's K-pop or whether it's more independent music. It's something to help with national branding. Just get it out there into the world and maybe success will come from an unexpected quarter. And there are ways, I suppose, that we might feel a bit uneasy with the government getting involved, but you could also look at it and say, hey, it's great that there is official support for the arts as well. While there is this international expansion, you write that indie bands tend to, and I quote, uphold a more intimate tie to geographic and temporal location. What do you mean? What I meant by that statement is there is an interesting comparison when you look at K-pop and Korean indie bands, if you say their music videos and what they are singing about, that curiously K-pop, and some scholars have written, for example, John Lee out of Berkeley has a, an interesting piece called What is the K in K-pop? So we have this very important letter that brands things that come from Korea, but K-pop is a very hybridized Form And though it has become recognizably Korean, it has become recognizably Korean by, in a sense, divorcing itself from Korea so that a lot of the performers are Korean, although K-pop gets in performers who are not Korean as well. But if you look at the songs or look at the music videos, there's very little that says that it is specifically Korean that they tend to do the sets in boxes and being based around dance and so on. Whereas Korean indie bands will often have songs that have background landscapes that you see from Seoul itself or songs that somehow reflect their location in Seoul and will be set at clubs or with bands or street scenes. So there's much more of a sense of place that you get from indie music than you do from K-pop itself. That was really what I was talking about with that. Another line you wrote is that Korean indie rock is increasingly embedded overseas, and we've talked about this, but also Overseas indie rock musicians are increasingly embedded in Korea, and you've hinted towards that uh, earlier. Can you tell us more about it? One of the interesting features of the independent music scene in Korea is that it does have a very high level of involvement by expats, by foreigners, and also diaspora Koreans as well. At this point, the Korean population has really by Korean standards, exploded in terms of the numbers of, of foreigners who are here. It's up to about 3% of the population. But my estimate would be that if you look at the indie scene, maybe 10 or 15% of the people who are involved are foreign. And Jeff Moses, who I, I mentioned from the band Whatever That Means, he's an important player in the scene. So he's a, an American. He put together one of the most recent compilations of punk music here in Korea. So you find there's are a lot of uh, expat bands who play. 
Interestingly, you'll go to shows. One of the most recent shows where I saw Love X Stereo play, it was interesting that the lead singer, Annie Coe, her between song patter was entirely in English. Maybe half the audience was foreign. Well, I shouldn't even say Western here because there are probably other foreigners who are about. And uh, one of the other bands was composed primarily of foreigners. I think there was somebody who was local. One of the other bands, the drummer, was a Westerner. It's just interesting to see this mixture. And it's a nice thing, I think, that you get a sense of this being a side of Korean society where there is easy mixing between people who are local Korean and people from the outside and that it has a cosmopolitan and international outlook. And you'll get other cosmopolitan or transnational Koreans, Annie Ko, whom I just mentioned, who grew up when she was young. She spent quite a few years living in the U.S. Another band that has gotten a lot of buzz is called Dead Buttons. It's a two-piece. And the drummer of that band is a Korean Paraguayan. So he is back his dominant language was Spanish, and so he's here in performing in a band. And you have other interesting examples like that of bands. So that you see ways in which that this is one of the areas, because it's a genre, an aspect of society which is itself cosmopolitan, is, is touching on the outside world. Music is really interesting that way in general. I think that it is one of the cultural spheres that most easily overlaps international borders, and that's true around the world, that music can travel because, in fact, it's not so much text-based the way that literature or theater would have a harder time because you really need to know what's being said, whereas people can love a song and respond to it without having any idea what's being said. And you can think of, for example, Gangnam Style, where people around the world are singing along in Korean without having any idea. I do remember watching the Today Show and just seeing at the height of the Gangnam Style viral craze, I thought it was awesome to see people in Manhattan. And you're looking out and seeing the sea of white faces and people are saying, you know, mo, 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 yoja. And then, like, that was the word they knew. It's like, wow, Sai has really, if nothing else, he has helped people, at least here, you know, with some Korean words. So that, that's very interesting. And I'd say that music is, I think as I was giving the answer to the question. So you see this in the indie scene, but again, as I also mentioned with K-pop, a lot of K-pop bands will have either transnational Koreans, you know, Sonia Shida, Girls' Generation, who had two Korean-Americans, or the band FX, which will also, the, one of the big members in there, uh, Amber, who is Taiwanese-American. So she's not even ethnically Korean. She's from the outside. She's not ethnically Korean, or, or other bands which will have Chinese members or Thai members and so on. So that's an interesting feature of K-pop. I mean, this again gets to this really interesting question of what is Korean about K-pop, if you have non-Korean performers as well. Your documentary is entitled Us and Them, Korean Indie Rock in a K-pop World. Who are us and them in this context? That's a, a really interesting question as well. We took the title from a CD, which was the one that I, Jeff Moses had co-produced, which is called Them and Us. And really, I think the most obvious reading of Them and Us for the CD is that each band does two songs, one of their own, an original, and then a cover by an influence. So that Them is the people that we really like and are covering. But in the liner notes, it talks about Korean indie and punk musicians existing in opposition to K-pop. It's we are trying to produce the music we feel passionate about in a time when K-pop dominates the airwaves. So it's setting up this opposition of mainstream and non-mainstream. But also in the liner notes, it talks about the fact that you will find Koreans and foreigners, men and women, hardcore and punk kids. So it's setting up this idea of you have us's and them's, but they can be set up in a way of alliance. And we deliberately chose the title because there's a certain opportunity to return interpretation back to the viewer. What do we mean by us and them? Who, who is us? Who is them? And in fact, the very first 
line in the documentary comes from Jeff Moses. And we're deliberately trying to jar people's expectations. So, oh, I'm hearing something on Korean indie rock. And what Jeff says, and it's for a show where they're performing back in the U.S. is, you know, I don't know what shit's like around here, but in Seoul, we get a lot of fucking foreigners who come in and they hear one song and then complain about things in the, the punk scene. And you're thinking like, what? Wait a second. He's complaining about foreigners. What is going on here? So it raises some interesting questions about how to, again, to understand Korea in its transformations in this decade of the 21st century, that ideas of national identity are really being shaken up in some pretty fundamental ways. To conclude, where do you see Korean indie music going in the future? Do you believe it will be as popular as some other genres, both domestically and abroad, or really just say closer to an underground movement? I'm really not sure where it will go. To say that it's underground, will stay underground, I I think you will continue to find bands who are performing and that it will stay on at much the same level that you have now. But I suppose there will be also opportunities for exposure overseas. So a positive thing will be that around the world, you might have an indie music fan in America who becomes increasingly aware of bands in Korea. And I do think that that's all to the good. And maybe the one trajectory and positive thing that I would say is that maybe if you went back 10 years ago or 20 years ago, that people would be more likely to think that authentic indie music could only come out of the Anglo-American access. And they might have thought that stuff that was coming from Korea or China would be a pale imitation of what real indie rock is. But I think now, as of 2015, you'll find more people who just say, hey, it's a good band. It doesn't really matter where they come from and can accept a Korean indie band as just as an equal of a band anywhere else and that what really it will come down to is the individual talent and originality of any given band no matter where it is located or what people's ethnicity is. Professor Epstein, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.